Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's talk on building a culture of collaboration. Uh, before we get started and I introduce our presenter, I just wanted to first uh, make a few announcements. First, um, Pluralsight does host weekly webinars, live events, and live codings like this one that you're in right now. If you'd like to view our upcoming calendar of events, you can go to pluralsight.com slash events. And secondly, the most common question that we get is that, uh, is if this webinar will be recorded? And the answer is yes, it will be recorded. You can, you will receive an on-demand link to this webinar to the email that you registered for it with. You can also visit Pluralsight's YouTube channel and view the uh, view the video immediately after the event as well. And finally, um, we will be doing some Q and A at the end of this event. So as soon as you get uh, questions or questions pop into your mind, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our presenter today. Alice Meredith has been leading and supporting high-performing teams for over 30 years. As a culture strategist, senior HR professional, and change management leader, Alice has pioneered multiple innovative concepts and techniques that support and enhance leadership effectiveness. She's a veteran facilitator, speaker, and content creator, and has published over a dozen Pluralsight leadership courses based on her experience uh, working in and leading Fortune 100 companies. And finally, Alice is passionate and committed uh, to the work she does helping leaders build diverse and, incl and inclusive environments where all uh, individuals and groups are free from prejudice and where no one culture, race, belief system, age, or gender is superior to another. And I think that's something we can all get behind. So. With that, uh, Alice, welcome. Thank you, Seth. I am very excited to have been asked by Pluralsight to facilitate this webinar. I do have to correct one intro. Um, I think, Seth, you mentioned that I've been leading Fortune 100 companies. I wish. I wish I'd gotten to that top <laughs> spot, but I have worked in leadership roles in Fortune 100 companies for the past 30 years. Um, so... Thank you for introducing me. So as a culture strategist, any and all leadership concepts that have to do with strengthening the cultures where we and our teams work is what I'm all about. Today, we'll be learning leadership concepts, or I like to refer to them as nuggets of leadership learning, nuggets to help both leaders and individual contributors establish cultures of collaborate. collaboration. That is a big word. I hope I don't stumble over that throughout our time today. Let's first cover what we'll learn. We are going to be talking about what collaboration is, why it's crucial to embrace and engage in it, and the when. When is it most needed? After that, we'll get into the meat of our learnings as I deep dive the how. How to become a leader that cultivates, encourages, and invites collaboration into their work environment and then how to best guide our teams to become better collaborators. And last but not least, we will talk about some roadblocks that kind of pop up in our journey and a few best practices on how to overcome them. Whew. I'm already feeling exhausted just reviewing our agenda. Yes, we have a lot of material to cover. So good thing I'm a fast talker. And yes, we will be flying high. I'll just be sharing a nugget or two of learning in each category due to the time allotted today. Please know, just one more reminder, as Seth said, there will be plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So as questions come up, throw them in the chat box, jot yourself a note, and bring them up later. So first is the what. Collaboration, as we all know, is a process through which a group of people, two or more, keep that in mind, two or more, constructively explore ideas to search for a solution that extends one's own limited vision. Collaboration occurs when we bring a team together or individual people from other teams to focus their efforts on a common goal. In a nutshell, collaboration is inviting insights and ideas to create synergy. So synergy is an old school corporate buzzword. Synergy is when the whole is greater than the simple sum of its parts. Or in other words, when two or more individuals, teams come together and combine, they create an outcome that is greater than the sum of their individual and separate talents. Basically, synergy is one plus one equals three. 
And that's the purpose of collaboration. And our last but most important learning to remember about what collaboration is, is that it is not a one-time event, nor is it easy to implement without practice. But the good news is that collaboration is a process that continues to get better over time. The more we invite our teams to collaborate, the more remarkable their working relationships become. Now, let's lean into the why. With companies where we work, having to stay relevant in this competitive and always changing global landscape, businesses are having to move at a faster pace than ever before. Collaboration leads to innovative solutions and results that businesses need to succeed. And the good news is that teams who collaborate effectively take pride in and thrive on the entire team's success and each other's success. It's more important now than ever to build cultures of collaboration. I am so excited that Pluralsight chose this topic due to the crucial nature of um, it being needed at this time. I love this quote, and it sums up the what and why of collaboration. You, as a leader, are not a reservoir of limited resources. Your conduit where diverse perspectives and ideas from your team can flow to help make sustainable change in your culture and in your business. So when, let's pop over to the when, when is it best to engage in collaboration? My TPOV or teachable point of view on this question is always, we all can recognize that as an individual contributor or a single leader or, depart or department, right? Cannot single-handedly achieve success without the help of others, without collaborating with others. So let's break my always down to be a bit more realistic. Collaboration, it's needed when a team needs to ideate on processes, culture, performance, or business rhythms. Basically, when the how you do what you do gets stagnant and not as effective as maybe it once was. If your team is questioning, if your how is really the right how, it's time to collaborate, put heads together, ideate on what change is needed to help you and your team best accomplish the results you are responsible to achieve. Collaboration is needed when we need to ideate on services and products we produce or create for our clients, or when we need to create that buzz-worthy marketing campaign. So that was a quick review of the <laughs> what, why, and when, but now we're going to transition to the meat of our learnings. This is the how. How do we build a sustainable, resilient culture of collaboration? Of course, of course, we can gather teams together and hold ideating meetings, town halls, and roundtables to gather diverse perspectives. Prior to launching out on my own, I spent five years just doing that spending time with teams all across the United States, facilitating and gathering insights to help leaders identify gaps in their struggling cultures. So yes, event-based collaboration, it's a thing. But if conditions that support safe and trusted collaboration are instilled first within your culture, all of those collaboration efforts won't thrive. And you'll miss out on your collaborating, growing organically, and becoming a part of your everyday culture. So let's continue on with the how. Good team collaboration relies on open and truthful communication. We know this, we get this. We open ourselves up to those we're close to, right? To who we trust, to who we feel have our back. But for this to happen, a culture of trust must exist between the leader and each employee and between the employees themselves. As leaders, it's our responsibility. Now employees have a part to play as always, but leaders kind of own that responsibility to create a psychologically safe work environment so all team members feel safe from judgment. Collaborative cultures that are built on a foundation of trust allows the team to contribute their ideas more freely. So Dr. Carol Gorman, she is well known for her research and insights on collaboration. 
she boldly shares that collaboration is a leadership issue. It requires a change in attitudes and behaviors of leaders and employees throughout the organization. My work experience as a culture strategist shows that this rings true to me. It all starts with leaders so much weighs on our shoulders, right? Or for those individual contributors who are working hard to be a leader, who are working to influence change from their role to support the company's mission. There's a lot of weight on our shoulders. So this next diagram continues from Dr. Gorman's teachings. It shows that establishing a culture of collaboration, right, takes effort, like I just said, both from the leader and effort from the team. And it is founded on trusted relationships. That's the key to building a sustainable and resilient culture of collaboration is those trusted relationships. So as we move forward, I'll be referencing these trusted relationships as a culture of trust. So let's dig deeper into the how by breaking down this diagram. And we're going to start first through the leader's lens. Leaders, man, we play a substantial part, right? In creating a culture of trust. We do this by becoming what is referenced as a trusted leader. Trusted leaders lead out with these three essential leadership skills. They're influenceable, right? They're transparent or genuine, right, is another good word here, and they show vulnerability. Let's unpack or double click on each of these. I plugged two buzzwords into that one sentence. You, you know, I think I've learned you either like the new corporate buzzwords or they get under your skin, right? Double click, I hear often in the tech environments, my husband exists in and unpack, I hear in the leadership world. Crazy fun words for some, okay. That was a squirrel moment for me. <laughs> Let's dig deeper. There we go in each of these three essential leadership traits. First, trusted leaders are influenceable. We can ideate and collaborate till the cows come home. And that one aged me. We can ideate and collaborate all day long. But if we ourselves as a leader of the team or if the executive leaders aren't open to being influenced. We all know it shuts down the sharing of ideas, no matter how creative we get. It's setting up collaborating events. So I've been coaching leaders for years to leave the shallow waters. My teams often heard me nagging them to stop hanging out in the shallow end. Okay, I know this isn't swim school. So let me explain what I mean by this. To become more influenceable, we must foster deeper work relationships with those on our team. I know, I just said it, build deeper relationships at work. It's the thing. It's the right thing. It's what we do now. And it's okay. But to do that, we must first leave the shallow waters, right? Shallow waters are when we've connected with our employees or our peer group on that shallow level. And my mean um, this is where we're connected to the point. We know their favorite sports team, they're married, not married, how many kids, their favorite vacation, maybe even their five-year career goal of each employee we leave. Nothing is wrong with shallow waters. They are a great place to start when building connections with those we work with. It's a safe place. A feeling of comfort exists when we hang out in the shallow end, but trusted relationships Trusted working relationships flourish in the deeper waters. These deeper waters create deeper connections, connections that forge and sustain our ability as leaders to become more influenceable or our ability as a peer to become more influenceable, most especially through collaboration, through the collaboration process. Trust from our team grows when we push past the shallow waters of casualness and learn more about each employee. This is where we discover what their worries are, their fears, what motivates them, what's most important to them, what are they mo most proud of and why. Now the deeper waters is where we too as leaders open up and allow our team to get to know us just a bit better or a lot better. I know some of you in the audience, this rings true too, right? Some of us just share everything. <laughs> 
And some of us are a little more reserved, right? There's kind of, maybe we feel there's a barrier between that leader and the employee and how far do I go? How much do I share? But the more we share, the more we find connections where our teams can see they're just like me. They have teenagers that are spending their lives or, you know, they too went to, you know, the same college, had some of these same experiences. Um, You know, they're struggling with the, with this you know, event in their personal life, or, you know, if they have their, we as leaders, we have our own fears and worries about work. This is where we go deep and we open ourselves up and connect and forge deeper relationships in these deeper waters. Relationships are critical to the outcome of any collaborative effort, which is why we're touching on that first from the leadership end. Collaboration is dependent upon well-developed work relationships among participants. We all know today's most successful leaders guide their organizations and their teams, not through command and control, but by guiding their teams with a shared purpose and vision, right? But to do this successfully, that relationship of trust between leader and employee is imperative. So some leaders, tenured leaders, as I already looked it up, hesitate with this concept of hanging out in the deep end. But times have changed in today's world. It's okay. And recommended to build deeper work relationships with those we lead. We can't influence other or be open to influence ourselves. If we lead from the office or if we lead from a position on an org chart high above our team, right? Our teams need to get to know us and we them to trust. They need to trust that we are influenceable to trust that we've got their back, that we care about their opinions, their perspectives, their ideas. So one word of caution, I just have to call this out. The key here is consistency. Most especially, I'm talking to leaders. We need to leave the shallow waters and go a bit deeper with every employee, not just the ones we might naturally gravitate to outside of work due to our similar likes or personalities. This happens. It happens. We make connections with select people on our team, and these people are more like us. We can talk to them. We can feel comfortable. We talk about the game. We talk about our kids. We talk about um, type of diapers. You know, we we buy for our kids. They they're in the same world we are, and there's a there's an underlying connection, and so we kind of gravitate that way. But as leaders, caution, caution, caution. As a culture strategist majority of my time is spent helping leaders with struggling cultures. The common ingredient found in broken cultures is favoritism. And favoritism stems from inconsistency of the leaders leading the team. If you've left the shallow waters with some on your team, but not all, odds are you might be dealing with a culture with some distrust and favoritism in it. So consistency, consistency, consistency (laughs) is a necessary ingredient in all aspects of leadership. Okay, okay, that was my my little squirrel moment, my little call out. Let's continue on and look next at how transparency plays a role in building cultures of trust. If you ask your employees which leadership skill they desire the most in their leader, I'm going to bet that transparency or being genuine, right? Will most likely be near the top of their list. We want that in our leader. We want real clear, direct communication and we want to know that they're always being genuine with us. So in research compiled by American Psychological Association, it shows that while 64% of employed adults, they feel their organization treats them fairly, 64%, that's you know higher than 50. But one in three, so 33% report that their their employer, the organization is not always honest and truthful with them. And 40% of employees don't believe their direct leader is open and upfront with them. So think of your team. This is just a survey represents, not saying it speaks exactly right to your teams, but it's a good gauge to go by. What if you looked at your team and thought, and almost 50% of them may feel that I'm not open, upfront, and transparent with them. 
these numbers represent roadblocks. These are some of the roadblocks that we come against in building a sustainable culture of collaboration. Transparency is key to building trust with our teams. Trust that will foster environments of sustainable collaboration. Transparent leaders work hard to practice what they preach. Leading in today's environment puts us in places where our employees see and evaluate. We know they do, right? They're talking about us all the time, how we show up. Um, it's essential that we lead our teams with integrity. Transparency in leadership means keeping your employees in the loop. There should be no unpleasant surprises, no concerns around uncertainty, and no wishy-washy behavior that may weaken a leader's reputation. Transparent leaders set crystal clear expectations and they communicate effectively with every member on their team. They are open with their employees, even if they feel vulnerable as a result. That's the hard spot. Vulnerability is also a buzzword we're hearing everywhere in our environments. Brene Brown introduced it with all of her books on leadership. It's huge. It's big. And I am so happy it has been called out in the leadership world. Now, being transparent <laughs> over the years isn't always easy because you don't know, what do I share? What do I not share? What's important to my team? What's not important to my team? And during my leadership journey, one thing that ran, ran true each time I found myself not being transparent. In the words of Forrest Gump, something always came up and bit me in the buttocks in one way or another whenever I felt at being transparent. It always circled back in a negative way. I am always coaching leaders to walk their walk. Let your team and others in your circle of influence see you. Show confidence by rocking who you are, being true to you. Don't try to mimic someone else's um, communication style or behaviors. Um, don't act the way you think others or your team might want you to. As leaders, we need to show confidence in ourselves and in our abilities. Now, to truly own you and walk your walk, we have to embrace vulnerability. There's that word again. And this is where two of our three key skills more. Vulnerability requires us to fully own and take personal accountability for our actions and our choices the good and the bad. We have all had, <laughs> I hope I'm not the only one, so I'm just bringing everyone else in the audience along on the journey with me. We've all had those moments where we've had the thought, did I really just say that? Or why in the world did I send that email? When will I ever think before I speak? We've all given or will give direction that wasn't clearly thought through. And we have or will respond emotionally when we shouldn't. These are common and natural blunders every human makes. Blunders every leader makes. Blunders every individual at work makes. And it's okay. The key is to recognize the mistake. Show vulnerability to your team. Ask them for grace. As you're learning, I'm learning every day and growing in my role. We're not the same leader as we were 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, heck, pre-pandemic, right? We all pivot and have to adjust and grow and learn. We have a brand new workforce, a different workforce. It has been changing and evolving so quick and fast. We have to adapt our leadership styles. As we do that, we're going to be making mistakes. We're going to um, have to get out of our comfort zone. And when we do that, mistakes happen, which is why we fear that, right? We fear getting out of our comfort zone, but it's okay. We've all been there. We will be there again. Leaders are always learning, no matter how tenured we are in our role. And vulnerability, this is where it comes into play, is asking for grace, correcting the mistake. And the big piece I think that many of us struggle with is giving grace to ourselves, saying it's okay. And then move forward and not let it weigh us down or dwell um, too heavy on us, right? Now, for some leaders, this process is easy peasy. For others, it can be quite challenging. A lot of it is based on our personality style. 
I had a big conversation with one of my adult sons just last night, um, challenging him to, to own up, right? To take responsibility for an action he made that um, hurt a relationship. And it was such a struggle for him to see the other side, um, coached him through how he could show up, words he can say. It's tough. It's tough for some. For me, as I, in the work environment, um, started embracing vulnerability, right? Um, talking to my team about mistakes I made and kind of became more transparent and genuine, it got easier over time. I still remember the first conversation that when I sat down, I was, was talking to a district manager who reported to me, I had made a poor judgment call and it really impacted um, her and her family. I hadn't looked at the whole situation. I didn't understand all the dynamics um, that were behind the decision I made. But as I talked to that situation with her after the fact and apologized um, for not really getting all the facts before I made a quick decision, um, it was tough. I still remember that uncomfortable feeling, but our relationship changed on a dime. It was such a life learning experience for me of the vulnerability piece when we pull down all of those barriers sometimes we put on our, <laughs> we surround ourselves with as leaders, it flips that relationship. We open ourselves up. We're all human. We all make mistakes. And as we embrace those mistakes, own up for them and ask for grace, relationships change. Now, another place leaders can lean in with vulnerability to become a more trusted leader is in our listening skills. So hang with me. That may sound a little bit odd, but let's explore this real fast. A very common opportunity for most all leaders is to become better listeners. I followed the same path after so many years of leading others and coming up against the same concerns or same situations. I, like many other leaders, felt I had the answers, been there, done that, already dealt with this before with another employees. So I would catch myself truly not listening to the conversation in the way I should. My thoughts would wander to another topic or another work situation I was dealing with, or I'd find myself preparing my thoughts as to how I would respond, right? Rather than truly listening. Now to break my bad habits, I had to be intentional. I did some on purpose work to assure I showed up with the mindset to listen, to learn. Let me deep dive this. Showing up with vulnerability means that you approach each conversation, recognizing that your point of view, your game plan, your strategy may be wrong or off course or just missing something. When we approach each conversation with this mindset, we show up more intentional about really seeking to learn from others' opinions. You'll find yourself approaching each conversation with curiosity, asking questions, and genuinely seeking for a new point of view, a new perspective, or a new idea that you hadn't considered before. If you too struggle with maybe interrupting others during a conversation or staying focused with what is being shared, try taking notes. Ask the person in advance, hey, I like to take notes. It helps my memory or helps me keep focus. Inviting vulnerability into our conversations dials up our listening skills, which in turn helps us become more of that trusted leader. So wrapping up the leadership segment of our diagram, the stars align as we connect these three leadership sweet skills. We start to see cultures of trust flourish. Cultures of trust between leader and employee, between employee and employee is the foundation we need to launch our um, sustainable cultures of, of um, collaborate collaboration. I knew, I knew I was going to stumble. <laughs> okay. We have explored nuggets of learning from the leader's lens. Now let's reference our diagram and explore what we need from our teams to help build cultures of collaboration. Of course, leaders were heavily engaged in this work, right? We guide and lead and coach our teams through their responsibilities. But of course, the first one is effective communication. Certainly a must have for successful collaboration. The team collaborating will need to be able to express themselves to each other. The problem we all know is that people communicate differently. So we're going to touch on a few roadblocks, common communication roadblocks that occur during collaboration sessions. 
Okay, let's tackle the over talkers first. Yep, it's a thing. We all know it's a thing. And some of us have been that person at one time or another. We all recognize that effective communication requires a substantial level of self-awareness but not everyone on the team has the self-awareness needed. This is why over-talkers seem to dominate conversations. They fail to notice that they might be the one keeping others from feeling their opinions matter or their voices heard. While it might be easier to just let the situation continue, it is the leader's role to privately coach the team member and encourage them to watch the room and ensure everyone has the opportunity to share their point of view. My youngest child was that kid in his elementary classroom, where before the teacher had the question even asked, he had his hand raised and literally jumping out of his chair to answer. Many times having no idea what he was going to say as the question hadn't been asked yet. So along with the teacher during a parent-student session, we had to be very specific and clear that he could not raise his hand a second time during the entire school day until every other kid had an opportunity to speak. It was seriously the hardest thing for him to do. His personality is such that he wants to be heard. So many times the overtalkers just need someone to call out to them, help them see how their voice dominates the room. Most have positive intention. They just lack the self-awareness to notice. Okay, our second common communication gap we come across in collaborating sessions is that there are always one or two or more who aren't great communicators. You know they have great value and perspectives to add. If you come across this situation and you're having trouble making sense of their idea or point of view, we need to slow down, ask questions, and make the attempt right to try to understand them. If need them, a private conversation afterwards can be had, but be careful not to discount or allow someone else to discount someone's ideas simply because they have trouble articulating them. And the last roadblock that is common and relevant in today's world is engaging the remote attendees. Hosting a meeting or a collaborating session over Zoom has certainly changed the dynamics of how we do what we do. So to ensure everyone has an opportunity to share their insights, you might need to introduce a formal process. So brainstorm with me a minute. I was thinking of this last night. How about a symbolic talking stick? We've all heard of a talking stick used in therapy or even referenced in many movies. As the stick or some object, right, moves around the room, everyone knows it's that person's time to share. For remote attendees, the leader could lob or toss an imaginary ball around the team. The leader might say, John, I'm thrown in your direction. This calls out to John that it's his turn to share. Then after sharing, John will choose who to send the imaginary ball to next. The ball gets tossed between attendees until everyone has it. This symbolically lets everyone know that everyone is expected to share without formally calling someone out. Okay, moving on, our second trait needed from the collaborating team is open-mindedness. A critical aspect of collaboration is being open to and accepting new ideas, right? Often collaborating sessions will include people from different departments. Because of this, each will come with a different expertise and perspective. For some, the ideas shared will be unfamiliar and possibly difficult to understand. A common roadblock that comes with so many diverse perspectives when merging people from different departments is that the team conversation might stagnate or it will break into silos as often they just don't know how best to proceed. So one solution to this, if this occurs for you, is to assign a leader who um, has a natural sense of curiosity. They thrive in this kind of an environment. Um, another way to encourage acceptance to new ideas with attendees from different departments is to set up parameters on what will be discussed. For example, the um, guidelines, right? When we all come together, we build out what are the guidelines? What do we want to have as our boundaries for our time together? But make it clear that all ideas are on the table before any one idea can be turned down. This allows equal opportunity for all ideas to be heard. 
Now, over-formalizing a collaboration process can also curb innovation. So there's kind of a little sweet spot there, a little balance. You got to read the room. You got to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. But we all know open-mindedness and curiosity go hand in hand. So to build the collaborative cultures we desire, leaders will need to find ways to encourage both in their team members. The third key team trait needed for successful collaboration is adaptability. Collaborative projects often don't go as planned. Priorities change up, barriers outside of the team's control delay progress, and many other problems occur. Now to persevere through all the barriers that will come up, the team will need to be able to adapt at a moment's notice. Now, adaptability is one of those crucial collaboration skills but it's one of those that are real difficult to teach, right? Adapting um, well to change comes with practice and experience. Um, I've authored and facilitated a plural, a plural site course titled Embracing Change for the individual contributor that kind of gives just a few little key nuggets that helps us become more adaptable. Key skill needed in collaboration. But the best advice here that I can give is to lead by example. As a leader, your key role is to stay calm and focused on the next steps. Keep the team from going to the freak out stage and transition them quickly to ideating a solution to the problem. As a leader, be the one to always keep your cool. And our last key team trait we'll review is the importance of encouraging innovative thinking. Creating space for innovation fosters a culture of collaboration. We all know that we are all trying to make that happen. But for some team members, we need to keep in mind that brainstorming sessions can be unnerving, especially if it's sprung on them without warning. Now, a good workaround for this is to give your team time to prepare their thoughts in advance. Not all of us can come up with ideas off the cuff. I'm one of the ones I'll be lying in bed the night after the brainstorming session and think, ding girl, I should have shared this idea. So to ensure all on the team have adequate time to come up with innovative ideas, keep your team informed and aware of the intent of the collaborating session. This way, all will feel more empowered to contribute on an even playing field. While there are many areas teams can show up to support a positive culture of collaboration, these four help get your team moving in the right direction. They're a good place to start. One last essential reminder to lift up is that conflict can and will rear its ugly head in collaborating sessions. Conflict happens in every company, organization, family unit in our nation, within our social networks, political arenas, sports teams, classrooms, um, clubs, wherever people with different backgrounds, priorities, and beliefs come together, conflict exists. And when it presents itself during collaborating sessions, leaders need to help manage the team through that process. I really wish I had more time today to deep dive how to lead others to conflict when collaborating, because it's a thing. It's a big thing. It's something we all need to really skill up in. But I don't think I could do it justice in the time allotted today. For those interested, I've authored two courses on this topic, understanding workplace conflict and managing workplace conflict with some additional nuggets that help correlate um, the work you do with managing and building a culture of collaboration. So far in our journey today, we've covered nuggets of learning on the what, why, when, and how, how from the leader's lens, and a few nuggets of how from the team's responsibility, where I'm going to transition to the where. I'm going to talk real fast through this because this is pretty basic. I think we all get this point. Just want to make sure it gets covered. Now, if some of you and your team find different places to collaborate, shoot out your ideas in the chat group, and we'll compile and share them back during Q&A Q time. So business meetings for sure, right? Virtually and in person. Kick each one off with group breakouts. Use the virtual breakout groups. Yes, they're a thing and they work. Don't give up on them. <laughs> give each group a problem or obstacle the company or team faces and have them spend 10 minutes just brainstorming. A solve may come up or it might not, but the fact is that the conversations start to flow. Stop building 
towers out of spaghetti noodles and marshmallows and use that same energy and team building opportunity to find real life business solves. It can be just as fun, I promise. Create insight gathering events. We've already talked about it. Roundtables, town halls, no matter the name you use, the key point is to bring the teams together. Um, if you're an executive leader and you travel to visit different teams you support, don't miss opportunity to pull a small team together and just chat. Chat about the good, bad, and ugly of the work experience. Create opportunities to always be learning from your team, both your direct and indirect report. So I'm going to put on my HR hat here and lift up how important it is to invite collaboration into performance reviews and one-on-one. -on -one. I know, I know some of you might be saying that, but remember how we define collaboration. It's a process which a group of two or more people constructively explore ideas. If you feel your performance reviews, your one-on-ones, your check-ins are all one-sided, take it up a notch. Invite collaboration and problem-solving conversation. Um, then as things open up again, business retreats and sales conferences. I've been to so many offsite retreats where we are celebrating the top performers on the team. We engage in activities like deep sea fishing, luau's, all that fun stuff, right? Um, companies used, well, used to, hopefully will again, <laughs> pull together to reward and celebrate their team at these events. We have the best of the best right there. Pull them together, have a collaborating session, problem solve, have the team idea on ways leaders of the company can help others on the team become top performers as well. Now, here's the kicker. As companies and leaders engage in and prioritize time for planned collaboration, and they make it a part of their regular business rhythms, team collaboration will organically morph. This is where the culture starts to just shake up and in and become a culture of collaboration. Lunch conversations between peers start to happen. Um, let's see, employees will start engaging in ideating while carpooling and rideshare vans are in tech, slacks, I am venues. This is the organic process of collaboration that helps us sustain the culture. Leaders are working on building trusted relationships with their teams. Team members have been trained and are being guided to becoming more effective communicators, innovating, becoming more adaptable. The stage is set. As we put these nuggets into play, the foundation is ready to support and sustain resilient cultures of collaboration. Well, that is our time today. I hope you're able to grab a nugget or two to help you in your work of building sustainable cultures of collaboration. To wrap up our time, I want to reiterate what we learned earlier in the quote by Dr. Gorman, as leaders become stronger in essential skills, right? Those sweet skills and learn through experience and practice to guide their team's behaviors. Our cultures can grow over time into ones where effective collaboration compels our teams and business forward. Henry Ford sums it up best in his quote, if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am going to pass the baton off to Seth um, to see if we have any questions on the Let's... screen real fast. Seth, before I start to you, I have all Go my ahead. contact information. Connect with me. Reach out. I would love for you to share a nugget that you learned um, share your feedback, what you liked about our time together, maybe what you wish I had included. So LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, connect. Love to be a part of your leadership journey going forward. Yeah, I think, uh, Alice, thank you so much. This was great. Um, we do have some questions to get to, but as you said, I'm sure your dream today would be to be bombarded with additional questions on Twitter and just to engage with people. Yes. <laughs> But, um, so the first question that, that we had that I, I really like is, um, how do you not play favorites with the strong, stronger performers on your team? Oh my goodness. Okay. I love, love, love this question. So I call them A players, right? We have our A players. They're our go-to people. We've become really connected with them, right? Um, and we, we give them more work. We lean on them. They are our favorites. We, get, we don't say that loud. We don't say that loud. But they are, right? Um, so after years of owning and managing engagement survey, guess who beats you up the most? Your A players. 
because we overwork them. We over lean on them and they see the B and C players. I know I hate labels, but I don't know how to, you know, define them, but the B and C players continue to come to work, do their stuff and not really be held accountable. So, um, you recognize it first, which is what you just said. We've identified it. We recognize it, realize that, um, they're not happy. You know, we have a good relationship. They're not happy and we have to invest our time. 80% of our time should be with B players. Um, 20, maybe with the A players to keep them growing, developing, to help them get promoted. B players, we want to lift them to be A players. That's where we need to focus our time. If we spend all of our time with the A players, favoritism occurs. Get in the weeds with the B players. C players are draining you, right? Hold them accountable. Performance manage them. Get them in the right role for them because they're draining the team. Oh, I said a lot for that answer. Sorry. That, that's awesome. There's kind of a follow-up question or not a follow-up question, but something that goes along with that where someone's asking, how do you deal with low performing members on the team? Would you add any, anything to what you just kind of mentioned? Um, don't let them suck up your time because they do. They just, whew, they drain us, right? You have to set clear expectations and hold them accountable. We have to be consistent in accountability. And if we're not, favoritism is going to run rampant in your team. Awesome. So this question, um, kind of from the perspective of a leader communicating to their team, how do you draw the line between being transparent, but also keeping, you know, confidentiality for like sensitive business information, I, I would right. suppose is what they're asking. Right, right, right. So um, always a hard one, right? I'm not a, a one answer that fits all teams, all companies, you know, some teams are more open and transparent and other teams are a little more, you know, siloed because we have a competitive global landscape. We can't let information get out to our competitors, right? Um, I encourage people to ask their direct lead report, right? Um, if you report up into the C-suite or the executive team, have those conversations, what should be shared, what shouldn't be shared. And then as you pull that information down to the leaders um, below you, make sure you're very clear as this can be shared and this can't be shared. If it's not clearly stated, it can't be shared, use your best judgment, but have those conversations so you know. That's awesome. Um, I want to pass along a few compliments. Kimberly Mitchell says, best speaker ever. Um, uh -huh. And someone else said, no question, just love the call outs to Brene Brown's books. She um, so to go on to another question, um, how do you deal with stakeholders that are stuck on legacy platforms and don't want to move forward with collaboration technology specifically? You're answering it with your eyes already. <laughs> I know it is hard. It is so hard for people to change and to adapt, especially like you said, those tenured, those legacy thinkings, right? It's a different world. Um, I teach a lot about generational perspectives, right? Um, the, the age groupings. I know people don't like titles, but you know, baby boomers, millennials, Gen Xers, um, I have a, a course and I, this is one of my most popular um, talks I do, but it is helping our executive leader see it's a different workforce. We lead based off our workforce needs. We adapt as leaders. We change up. We need to give them what they need. So how you deal with it um, as learning, we talked about becoming influenceable, right? And for our team to come up to us, but we need to work on becoming an influenceable leader upwards and um, to influence without authority. And it's tough. Build those relationships with those above you so you can start having some of those crucial conversations. They need to hear it. They need to listen to your thoughts and your ideas. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer, but I can just like um, empathize with you because those are tough. That's great. Alice, how do you walk the line between, as a leader, between collaboration and then micromanaging and, and occasionally having too many cooks in the kitchen? Um, I think it depends on the topic, right? If you're collaborating on a process or a product or a marketing campaign, something that has substantial um, meat and content to it, um, you have to have a formalized process. You have to set this person leads the project. They are the final decision maker. They will pull in all the ideas and perspectives, but the final call has to roll up to one person. Otherwise, it can just um, 
get over the top. Now, if you're collaborating about um, your team, how we do what we do, good ideas, processes to be more effective in our work or our culture, right? What works, what doesn't work. Um, that is just sharing ideas, sharing ideas, sharing ideas with the leader sitting there um, so the leader can learn. But it, those processes have got to be formalized. Exactly. Um, I, I think that's all the questions that we have. I want to I want to thank you again, Alice, for taking the time today. Um, and just as a reminder to the audience, this talk was recorded. You'll receive an on-demand link to the email that you registered with. You can also go to Plural Sites YouTube channel and find it right away. Um, before we go, Alice, do you have any kind of final takeaways or last thoughts for the audience about creating a culture of collaboration? You know, the um, collaborating is really just getting different perspectives than ideas, right? Giving the team opportunity to innovate and to share. There are so many voices that are heard. There are so many perspectives that can change up how we do what we do, right? And so becoming a team who values and truly, truly seeks others' perspectives, I mean, that's the key. Whether you're doing it one-on-one, you're collaborating one-on-one, right? Asking questions, whether you're um, pulling together events to town hall to gather feedback. It's all about building those trusted relationships, being that trusted leader where people will talk to you and share. And then we've got to be influenceable. So I think I just summed up my entire 45 minutes in about 20 seconds. We should have just had <laughs> a 20 great. second webinar saved all this time. We'll edit it. That's we'll awesome. edit that down in post. Thank you. Thank <laughs> no. you very much. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Alice, thank you. And, and thank you everyone for attending. Bye. Thanks. Connect with me.